today we are going to speak on pre medication pre medication for both ga and regional anesthesia pre medication is common to both of them what is the definition of pre medication this is the administration of drugs before induction of anesthesia what are the components of pre medication the components can be divided basically into two parts one is pharmacological component one is psychological component coming to the psychological part when a patient is subjected to surgery or is awaiting surgery patient automatically becomes very apprehensive of death of pain of other comorbidities and morbidities which they are not very aware of they think that operation will lead either to death or to pain or to something untoward they may not wake up at all although they are alive so the psychological part is the anesthetist goes to the patient and explains everything starting from what they are going to do and during the time of operation and the patient recovery telling them that the chances of death is less than when someone is walking down the road the chances of death when someone is walking down the road is 1 in 10000 and in anesthesia it is lesser than that especially we are very cautious about children because they start crying at the sight of a doctor so they have to be taken care of and the adults have to be explained coming to the drug part of it what are the drugs we use in pre medication this consists of drugs which is administered 1 to 2 hour before induction of anesthesia we had spoken about induction of anesthesia in ga or before the regional anesthetic is applied what are the routes of administration of pre medication it can be oral route intramuscular intravenous transnasal and transdermal patch what are the goals of pre medication when we are giving pre medication we must have some goals which we want to achieve goals can be primary goal and secondary goal what are the primary goal number 1 is anxiolysis and sedation patient must be made quiet before we administer anesthesia and a bit of sedation helps the patient from coming from the ward to the ot and the patient's apprehension is less when the apprehension is less the blood pressure pulse rate they also are not high otherwise when the patient is apprehensive there is a lot of catecholamine released into the system from the adrenals and from other parts and so the blood pressure and the pulse rate rises so the primary goal is number 1 is anxiolysis and sedation number 2 is analgesia when we subject a patient to anesthesia the patient's primary consideration is pain so in the primary goal we give one and anesthesia and an analgesic drug to lessen the pain during the induction of anesthesia amnesia 
patient should forget about whatever has happened to the patient and amnesia should be anterograde there are two types of amnesia retrograde amnesia when someone forgets what has occurred in the past that is called retrograde and amnesia and anterograde amnesia is what is going to happen so we give a drug where the patient won't know what is going to happen later on number 4 is increase the gastric ph and decrease gastric volume because if there is aspiration if the ph is less so if the ph is less there is a chance of acid aspiration and the lung damage or if the gastric volume is large there can be chance of aspiration and lung damage so we increase the ph from acidic ph to alkaline ph and decrease the gastric volume how we are going to come anti sialagog when the patients are apprehensive there is a lot of secretion from the salivary glands and from other endocrine and exocrine glands so this must be reduced sensory reflexes are high when the patient is apprehensive and is ready to undergo anesthesia so we have to decrease the sensory reflex by giving the patient a sedative hemodynamic stability if the pulse rate and the blood pressure is stabilized by all the medicines which we administer there will be hemodynamic stability and there won't be an increase in blood pressure or pulse rate and very importantly all the premedication will decrease the requirement of anesthetic drugs later on which will help in faster recovery if we use less anesthetic drug the recovery will be faster what are the secondary goals number 1 is facilitation of induction of anesthesia if the patient is not apprehensive there is anesthesiolysis there is no increase in blood pressure there is no uh, increase secretion so the induction of anesthesia be becomes smoother and facilitation of post operative analgesia if we give an analgesic prior to the operation this is carried over beyond the operation and so the analgesia is present when the patient comes out of anesthesia prevention of pons post operative nausea and vomiting this must be prevented number 1 because it causes a lot of harassment to the patient when the patient has nausea and vomiting after anesthesia and the chances of aspiration is also there you must have read about mendelson syndrome so mendelson syndrome is when there is acid aspiration this must be avoided post operatively what are the factors we consider before premedication number 1 is the physical status is the patient with comorbidity or is the patient absolutely fit asa1 we had spoken of asa1 to 6 in earlier classes a patient is physically fit asa1 in asa2 3 4 5 we have to consider what type of premedication we can give and in the highest grade we don't premedicate the patient because the patient is almost sedated age at higher age group or in lower age group extremes of age the premedication dose should be tailored we must look at the patient 
about the anxiety and pain factor present when we go for pre-anesthetic checkup. If we find the patient hale and hearty, not bothered about what is going to come for surgery, automatically the drug dosage is decreased. Timing of surgery. Suppose throughout the day the last case is what the patient will be allotted to. So the patient will have to suffer the, throughout the day of anxiety and all the problems associated with anxiety. So the patient must be given a higher dose of pre-medication. The history of drug allergy or history of nausea and vomiting must be taken and are very important so that that drug is avoided and for nausea and vomiting uh, any drug like ondansetron is given which prevents nausea and vomiting. For anxiolysis and sedation, the sedation ranges from a minimum anxiolysis to a state of deep sedation if the patient is very very apprehensive. You know, patient is crying. So give, we give a higher dose of sedation, anything short of general anesthesia. This must not be as high to cause the patient to go into an anesthetic level of sedation. Number two is to minimize the physical discomfort and pain. Number three is to control behavior. I have already spoken that patients also may have behavioral problem. A patient is mentally deranged we'll, and the patient is always throwing tantrums. We have to sedate the patient much more compared to a normal patient. And that will avoid the patient's extra movements which can be very harmful during induction of anesthesia. To minimize psychological disturbances and distress, we should give this anxiolytics so that the psychological disturbances even in normal patients is less and there is less distress. Maximize the potential of amnesia. Very important, the patient should not remember what had happened when the patient comes into the OT and gets out of the recovery, back to the ward. This whole period should be totally forgotten by the patient. And the most important thing is all this is done with the patient's safety factor in mind. What are the drugs used in sedation? The, they are benzodiazepine like diazepam, midazolam, lorazepam. They all cause anterograde amnesia. So not only they you are used for sedation, they are used for amnesia as well. In some cases where the benzodiazepines are contraindicated or the patient has allergy to benzodiazepine, we have to use phenobarbitol, like phenobarbital. We have to give the patient phenobarbitol. But these days phenobarbitol is less used and benzodiazepines are used much more. Phenothiazine like they, these drugs may have to be used when the patient is very, very apprehensive. What are the factors which limit sedative administration? As I said, extremes of age, sedative should be low. Patient has come with head injury and has to be operated for head injury or for some other related injury. Patient comes with polytrauma like head injury and other fractures. Here the sedative administration must be lower. 
altered mental status due to head injury or concussion the, pa the patient's mental status is altered here we have to use less dose when there is minimal cardiopulmonary reserve like in echocardiogram we see that the patient's ejection fraction is between 20 and 30 percent patient is orthopnic here also we have to decrease the dose of sedative or omit in some cases patient is hypovolumic the patient is totally dehydrated and we have to go in for emergency procedure in case these cases the dose of sedative should be lower when the patient is in full stomach and needs immediate surgery we don't put the patients on sedative at all because that may cause regurgitation and aspiration what are the analgesics we use the mainstay of analgesia is opioid we use morphine pethidine fentanyl alfentanil and a lot of opioid drugs have come into the market these days secondly we use non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs like diclofenac sodium keterolac these are available in not only in tablets but in injectable forms anesthetists usually only use injectable medicines except for premedication on the night before operation there are non nsa drugs there is only one we know this is paracetamol this can be used either as tablets or as injectable what are the factors which affect aspiration again extremes of age emergency cases i said the patient may come in full stomach type of surgery patient comes with pregnancy cesarean the patient usually the gastric emptying time is increased so the patient may have full stomach patient has recent meal and we are aware that the patient has meal but the emergency procedure anesthesia has to be carried on when the patient's level of consciousness is low altered mental status or consciousness is low or absent these all increase the chances of aspiration morbidly obese, obese patient very very fat patient they are a problem to the anesthetist to the surgeon they cause a lot of problem because they have a lot of comorbidities along with them diabetes hypertension hypothyroid uh, they can have cushing's disease also difficult airway difficult airway is a problem which we are very aware of i had spoken in last lectures that we always take care that the dif difficult airway is avoided or we take precautions during intubation for difficult airway difficult airway can increase the chance of aspiration during intubation when there is poor motor control of the patient like motor neuron diseases here the motor neuron diseases the motor activity is less so all the sphincters the whole system is relaxed and so the chances of aspiration are more and in diabetes mellitus there is of course an increased chance of aspiration how do we prevent aspiration number 1 is fasting we keep the patient fasting for 4 to 6 hours for adults 
and less for neonates or pediatric patient. We have to in reduce the gastric pH, uh, increase the gastric pH and decrease the gastric volume. So, how do we increase the gastric pH? By giving drugs which are like antacids and increase the gastric pH by giving prokinetic agents. Sorry, decrease the gastric volume by giving prokinetic agents. So, here we use ACE2 receptor blockers like ranitidine proton pump inhibitors like pantoprazole and antacids like gelusin. So, to increase the gastric motility, to decrease the gastric volume, we use prokinetic agents like metoclopramide. There is an increase in secretion as I had spoken earlier due to anxiety that has to be decreased prior to surgery. So, we give glycopyrrolate or atropine both intravenous to decrease the secretion and facilitate our induction. For to prevent gastric aspiration or PONV, what we do? We give antiemetic drugs. What are these? These are metoclopramide or prokinetic agent. We can give ondansetron which acts in the brain to prevent nausea and vomiting and of course, steroid has an antiemetic component which we use sometimes when the patient has no contraindication to steroids. How do we continue or discontinue the drugs? prior to anesthesia and surgery. There are certain drugs which should be stopped prior to surgery and anesthesia and so there are certain drugs which may be continued for anesthesia and surgery. The drugs which can be continued are when the patient is on beta blocker, the patient is on bronchodilators and the patient is on anti-epileptic drugs. And in cases of anesthesia and surgery, the drugs which should be stopped are monoamino oxidase inhibitor, anticoagulants, patient is getting anticoagulant for whatever reason, oral hypoglycemic agents, these have to be stopped, ACE inhibitor, well, these have a question mark because they should be stopped, but in some cases they have to be continued. Otherwise, we do not have any alternative. And angiotensin 2 antagonists, these also have, I have put question marks because preferably they should be stopped, but if it cannot be stopped, we have to go along with it. In conclusion, what does premedication do? They reduce the morbidity of surgery, they increase the quality and decrease the cost of perioperative care. They return the patient to desirable functions earlier and preoperative medical optimization also reduces the complications, the morbidity of surgery and anesthesia significantly. And last but not least, I am telling you again, if you have not understood or, or if you have any questions regarding any of my lectures, you are free to write to the authority and I will answer them. Okay. Thank you.